Thank you for joining us today, everybody. We're privileged to sit down today with Scott Stornetta, the Chief Scientist at Ugin Partners. Thank you so much for joining us today, Scott. Oh, it's a pleasure. Great, it's my pleasure. So if you wanted to kind of briefly give, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, certainly, um, I mean, first and foremost, I'd say that we're a, a venture capital firm and I'm a partner at the firm. The Chief Scientist title, I think, um, I don't think it raises my salary. It just um, signifies that I do have a technology background and um, we, we pride ourselves on making <clears throat> decisions that make a lot of business sense, but that are based on a technological deep understanding of what it is that people are offering the companies in which we invest. Um, and then I should clarify that our first fund is focused on the enterprise blockchain space. Not to the neglect of other applications of the broader blockchain space, but because for a variety of reasons, we think those are the, mo the enterprise B2B space is where we think, contrary to many, um, the most currently salient opportunities lie. How does your technical background um, benefit you in, <clears throat> in this respect? But I guess also to dive a little bit deeper, I'm curious, like there's lots of people like say developers who have technical backgrounds, like what is the difference between a chief scientist and say like a chief technical officer? Sure. Well, I think the starting point is that my doctorate is in physics from Stanford, and therefore I was trained in the, the ways of scientists. Um, it certainly gives us a particular framework for how we analyze problems. We, you know, we, we were very deliberate in naming the firm Yugen because first of all, I have some appreciation and background with Japanese culture, but because the word connotes a deep understanding of how things really work, how, how nature really is and sort of, and uh, that's very much in accord with the way a typical physicist would approach problems. We want to understand problems from their fundamentals and solutions from their fundamentals. Uh, it's not unlike what you'll find, um, you know, Elon Musk is well known for saying that he doesn't like reasoning by analogy, but rather reasoning from first principles. And I'd say it's roughly that same mindset. Now, having said that, <clears throat> you know, the PhD from Stanford, we always used to joke, it means that in a particular topic, I may be ignorant, but I am educable. I can, uh, I know how to learn. And yet, it's not just a technical foundation for us that's filtered through 20, plus years of experience working with uh, startup companies and understanding what it takes to make a viable and successful startup. And while it's good to have that technological foundation, it's also good to know how, how real startups thrive or fail. And so, we have a very conceptual approach, a kind of physicist's discipline approach to problems and understanding them in their fundamentals, but we're bringing a lot of business experience to bear as to what, what is viable and what is perhaps, even though it has the right ideals, potentially has a lower probability of making it through to being successful. Again, we're not cynical about people being idealists. We, 
think a lot of the blockchain slash crypto ethos um, draws on people that do have some idealism in them. Uh, and we respect that. Having said that, there needs to be a groundedness in people's plans if they expect to, to get from where they are to the kind of nirvana that they imagined at the end game. I believe Mark Andreessen says that in the internet, there are no bad ideas. There's only bad timing or something along that to that effect, which I sort of interpret as like, there's bad business models if there's no bad ideas. Yeah, and, and there's bad execution. There's a lot of bad execution. Um, one of my business mentors used to say that most startups don't die of starvation, they die of indigestion. And I think it's a very telling point. There's plenty of opportunity, but you have to execute well and you have to be focused and you have to be disciplined. Um, and it's not all about just working long hours. It's, it's, it's working smart and knowing how to create real value for the customer. So yes, I could probably echo some of Andreessen's uh, comments. I guess it's probably also worth adding just for your listeners that another aspect of this that makes us a little bit unusual is that um, you know, I have a very early background in blockchain related work. Um, I think the simplest way to describe it is if you were to look at, and I'm, I'm sure you're up to speed on this, but just for the benefit of your listeners, if, if you look at the Bitcoin white paper, you know, there are, there are eight footnotes in it and fully four of those um, are references to the work that Stuart and I did, Stuart Haber and I did back at part of the old Bell Labs, Bell Communications Research. And so there's foundational work about the blockchain that informs us as to how we think the space will play out. What was your first reaction when you either read the white paper or stumbled upon the technology in terms of how this idea was executed? Right. Well, I guess I'd say a couple of things uh, as preface to that, and then I can tell you my reaction. First, <clears throat> I had very much been part of the um, whole crypto, if not anarchy uh, notions, crypto libertarian notions, and had felt that a number of people well before Satoshi, David Chom in particular comes to mind, that the sort of ethos they espoused was one that I was very sympathetic to and considered myself quite involved in that space. Having said that, there was uh, something of a lull between the early work that I did and the publication of the 2008 Bitcoin paper. And as a result, um, I hadn't been, you know, on the news feeds and whatnot in that space uh, for a few years. And so my first introduction <clears throat> to Bitcoin came uh, when I started receiving unsolicited mail from people that I did not know saying, hey, I, you know, was looking at the Bitcoin paper and I see that several of the references are to your work. And then uh, oftentimes they would say, I also Googled you and noticed that you're fluent in Japanese. And so I was wondering if you're willing to disclose that you're Satoshi. And um uh, you know, caught me a little off guard. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's how I was first reintroduced back into the space. And now let me come to be responsive to the question that you raised. And that is what was my initial re reaction? Um, well, I thought it was a very clever piece of work. And this is something that Stuart and I have discussed at some length. Having said that, I felt that um, 
he also had some curious uh what i would call suboptimal decisions on the engineering side that were made and i don't say that to try to take away from what satoshi did because i really do view it as uh, you know a, a genuine work of genius but having said that i feel no um no hesitation in treating it as simply one stage in a progression that I think will lead to even better work. And I know that that sets me in opposition to some people who feel like um, he got it right and that's all there is to it. Um, I, I'd be the first to note that it has a vitality and um, staying power at amply demonstrated over the last 12 years. And I'm happy to give uh, great credit to that. Um, but that doesn't make it the final word in the best way to achieve the goals that Satoshi himself uh, outlined. Um, so again, uh, I have a lot of respect for what's been accomplished, but it's certainly not um, a kind of hero worship. I, I would say that um, much of the um, attractiveness that we associate with Bitcoin comes from the demonstration that there is a need for such a thing as opposed to how well suited it is for filling that need um, many many early um, developments get much of their deserved acclaim because they highlight a problem that needs solving. They, they speak to a need that people perhaps felt they did not know they had or that others didn't sense there was such a need, but you get such a positive response to it and it garners so much attention because it is so validating of the fact that there is a need in this case for a, a need and a benefit for a currency that could achieve the goals that Satoshi set that allows peer-to-peer um, -peer interaction in a global fashion. Uh, and I think that's much of the um, success, if you will, of Bitcoin as a social phenomenon. Is to, is to stand in as a worthy first attempt at addressing a need which uh, much more clearly came into focus after we saw that there could be a Bitcoin. And, and so again, I hope people understand you know, my position as a very positive one, but still I would suggest that Bitcoin, by its own um, definition of success, in you know, in that what Satoshi attempted to accomplish, I think Bitcoin uh, has fallen quite a bit short of that ideal. And are you talking in terms of electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash? Well, again, that is the title. So, and um, to begin with, I think Bitcoin is much more, much closer to being a currency than having the nature of cash. In fact, I think, um, well, I could go on at some length about um, my own um, particular interpretations of what Satoshi thought he was trying to achieve and what he, in fact, ended up achieving. But it's, it's, it's much uh, closer to being a currency than to actually having the properties that cash as 
than US dollar bills have. Um, the anonymity of it is, it, you know, is as many have explained, is really pseudonymity. Uh, I mean, you have a complete ledger of all the transactions. Um, if that's not traceable, nothing is. And the notion of peer-to-peer -peer as well, um, I think that certainly can be challenged, not in the ideal that he tried to achieve, but just on the basis of the current reality. Um, I could take that up if you want, but I don't want to just keep talking without getting your interjections of where you'd like to take that conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of places we could take that conversation. I guess I'm curious uh, of staying maybe on the topic of Bitcoin now before shifting gears to like discussing value creation in a blockchain setting or the industry. I'm curious then, uh, you know, so we've outlined these, these shortcomings in um, Satoshi's attempt to accomplish the stated goals. And I'm curious, are kind of solving those problems shortcomings, a main focus of Yukon Partners? Well, <clears throat> once a physicist, always a physicist, you can't stop thinking about those things because that's just kind of what you do when you wake up in the morning. But Yukon fundamentally has a fiduciary duty to its investors to identify attractive investments and then simultaneously investments that we feel <clears throat> sort of advance the social agenda um, that we are advocates of, okay? But it has to be both. It can't just be um, uh, because this advances a social agenda but has no chance of, of uh, commercial success, we're going to invest anyway. We can't do that but neither are we interested in investing things that we think have a negative social impact, but that could be highly successful. So, you know, we're pursuing the dual objectives and we do have some ideas that bear on the issue raised that we may in fact end up setting up the companies ourselves, <clears throat> attracting the right management team and then investing in them simply because <clears throat> no one else has come up with the right idea in a particular area to our satisfaction. So we don't, we don't consider ourselves incapable of uh, solving and addressing the problems, but we first primarily look to see what other clever people have done to address the problems and see if they would benefit from our investment and expertise. And only if we find the offerings in a particular space wanting, do we feel compelled to kind of seed the, the space with our own uh, best thinking. What are some of the social ideas that Yugen advances? Well, again, I think that consistent with what you'll hear from many people in the so-called crypto community, there's an appeal of being able to um, reduce the concentrations of capital and authority that often lead to poor uh, decisions, to a kind of arrogance, to inefficient allocation of funds, to rent-seeking behaviors, to the problems of monopoly. All of those things, I think, are genuine problems in the existing structure of capitalism. And so creating a more level playing field, a more peer-to-peer -peer world, a place where um, innovation um, is, is fostered and encouraged and capital alone is not able to dictate the outcome, a place where People enjoy greater personal freedoms and feel that um, they have more individual autonomy and, and liberty. I think all of those are worthwhile um, goals. But again, it's, it's, it's very easy 
and historically demonstrated that it's often the case that investment firms like a, a venture capital firm get so caught up in the excitement of the ideals that they are not investing prudently. Um, I think a lot of people would say, for example, just to cite a historical example, that um, Kleiner Perkins, which at one point was the acknowledged king of uh, the VC world, may have gotten a little ahead of itself in uh, a big push for environmentally sustainable uh, companies and invested more with their heart than their head and ran into trouble as a result. And I, and I simply cite that as an example of what can happen if you're not careful. Um, your ideals absolutely should, should be a kind of guiding star that motivate, but you have to be grounded in the viability, the self-sustainability of enterprises. So this makes me think of something I was initially thinking in terms of like, let's say you have some social goals. I, in my opinion, at the very least, achieving those social goals is, is only helped along by the commercial success. And yeah. so here you, you gave an example where they let their heart lead the way and ultimately their goals on the social side were ne never came to fruition. They were never able to see it through. And in a sense, probably created more uh, headwind for the achievement of the social goals because people that were neutral or maybe biased negatively could then cite those as, as examples of spectacular failures where you know, hard-won capital was allocated and squandered. And so, yes, they, they really do have to work hand in hand. You have an ideal world that you'd like to help bring about. I mean, we all you know, want to change the world for the better. And yet there has to be a carefully plotted sequence of steps that take you from where things are to where you want that world to be. And that really comes down um, to being commercially viable. Could you discuss further commercial viability in the blockchain? either this present state or how, what characteristics of a project or the humans behind a project that you can highlights while sure. analyzing? Sure. So this really goes back, if you will, to the comment I made early on in this discussion that we find ourselves concentrated mostly in enterprise business to business blockchain applications. Why is that? It's because <clears throat> fundamentally, the lens that I have learned through decades of consulting and in commercialization, technology commercialization, as well as with startups that I myself have been personally involved with, is that there has to fundamentally be value creation driving suitable technology and not technology per se um, creating the value just because it's clever technology. Um, that latter stance is a kind of, of, if we build it, they will come kind of attitude. And it's not to suggest that there aren't highly disruptive, really cool technologies, but they, they so often fail to situate themselves in a way that actually creates value in the here and now for customer number one. So many times technologists get ahead of themselves and say, if everyone widely adopted this, then the net result would be that there would have been a lot of value creation. And that can be true, but simultaneously irrelevant. It has to be if this first person adopts this, it already can conveys to them a perhaps modest, but still meaningful benefit. And then as more people adopt it, 
there are incrementally greater effects and we start to get these network effects that any uh, startup company would, would um, long for. But you cannot base a business on the notion that when we get to massive scale, then there will be benefits, but there are no benefits for early adopters and when the network is small. Um, I'd say that's probably the, the biggest shortfall that I see in most um, technologically driven or idealistically driven startups is not having adequate respect for how very, very challenging it is to plot out the incremental steps that take you from A to B to C to D all the way to your desired end state. And in a way that's, go ahead. Oh, in a way it's like uh, s symptomatic of like not thinking about what's in the best interest of that first customer. And I wonder if like some of this in the tech scene in general is arises from the presence of venture capital in it. Cause I've always kind of seen myself more as like a small business type of person where that first customer is everything. And I learned through blockchain, especially since Ethereum came to fruition that a lot of entrepreneurs they're concerned first and foremost with vcs and yeah. i feel like that if it takes a special person who's raising capital to also know that along that route they need to really value that first user what are your thoughts on kind of that yes well um i'm a fan of what you're discussing let me try to state it uh in words that are familiar with for to me and that is um in a sense, the, the core idea of a company funding itself uh, as a small business that pays its own way is, in a sense, the foundation for success no matter what. Now, now you know, it's, it's, um, it's not always achievable to self-fund. In fact, it's very often uh, not achievable to self-fund, but it still doesn't make that notion of a focus on the initial customer and creating a small amount of value, even in the early going, as, as very important. And it suggests that one, one in a sense, should say, well, what's the minimum amount of money that I need to take from outside sources in order to get into this, um, this desired uh, self-sustaining growth phase? Okay? Uh, we don't want to have to take capital forever. And so um, how do I get to more organic growth that is self-funding? is something that we are constantly uh, looking to those companies that we invest in to feel that way. We want them, and this is, you know, this is an old saying of venture capital, we want them to feel that it's the expertise that we bring as much as the money uh, to help them grow